Morning Hill City. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. We're so excited that you're here with us today. Uh, before we get started today with our question, I just wanted to let you know that the house church preview date, can you stop? Are you really trying to mess me up because you're doing a good job? My brain's going, what's this? What's this? What's this? Good morning, Hill City. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. We're so excited you're here with us today. Uh, we just want to welcome you here to, I can't even do this. This is why I don't do this. This is why I don't do this at my house either. This is why I don't do this. Okay, okay. All right, here we go. Good morning, Hill City. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. We're so excited that you're here with us today. Uh, before we get started today with our question, I just wanted to let you know that the house church preview date is going to be on June 13th at 5 p.m. So if you're interested in seeing what a house church is really like, please go look in the comments and find the, the sign up link for that. And we would love to have you join us for that. So today our countdown question is, if there was one thing that you would say is a great smell. It's your favorite smell in the whole world, but somebody else might think it's a weird smell or even maybe a gross smell. What would that smell be? We're gonna learn brand new things about each other today. I would say a weird smell that I enjoy that others might not enjoy is probably maybe nail polish remover, which is weird, I know, maybe a chemical smell, but I enjoy it. So let's talk about it, let us know down in the comments. Bye.
Hello, Hill City. Welcome to our third part of our new series, The Big Story. If you haven't seen the rest of the sermon series, you can always check it out and catch up on Facebook or on our Vimeo and YouTube channels. And don't miss out on digging deeper into all these topics. We're sending out new resource emails every Monday that have instructions and uh, videos and links to books that you can uh, use to dig deeper into each subject. Two of those have gone out so far. If you are not on the mailing list, contact me, Hannah Paschal at myhillcity.org to get added to that list. We just want you to really make the most of this and take uh, what we're calling the big story challenge to watch every sermon uh, and dig in every week so that you can learn more about the big story of the Bible. Well, if you have been following along, you might have asked yourself this question. And I think some people in the broader world have asked this question too. How exactly is the Bible, this one book we often uh, show people, actually one big story? After all, you might say, I've tried to read the Bible or I have been reading the Bible for a really long time and I don't see how it's one story. Well, scholars have actually argued the same thing for many, many years. Uh, they don't necessarily see the Bible as presenting a unified story. In fact, the idea of an overarching narrative or meta narrative governing everything from Genesis to Revelation, they say shouldn't be used. We shouldn't talk about the Bible that way because unlike a typical story or narrative where we see loose ends tied up and plot points explained and certain themes or characters um, presented the same way throughout, the Bible instead seems to present a collection of literature, uh, history, poetry, prophecy, and the like that feels pretty disconnected sometimes. And there are plenty of loose ends in it, uh, accounts of uh, bizarre things that people still argue about today, and bad guys who never really get their due. There are plot points that are never connected with others, and men and women who are presented differently from one book to another. If God really wanted all of these accounts to show one big story, somebody might say, then why didn't he make the plot connect better? This can be pretty frustrating for those who are told, hey, just read the Bible. It's easy, get to know the story. Because in truth, it is pretty complicated. But yes, there is a but in there, pretty big one. Yes, I know, I had to do it. Here's the thing, just because a storyline is complicated doesn't mean that that storyline doesn't exist. Here's an example. Anyone obsessed with the Marvel movies or shows? Okay, maybe not obsessed, even mildly interested. You've seen most of the movies and some of the TV shows. If you are not, feel free to glare next to the person, uh, next <laughs> to the person next to you on the couch who's nodding along, right? Or text them, you're a nerd. Uh, but for all of you who like me, who really enjoy those movies and shows, uh, I want you to answer this. What do you call, or what is a phrase associated with that world? What is a phrase associated with that world? Well, it is the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I know someone said it and got smacked with a pillow, right? The Marvel Cinematic Universe. They might have called it the Marvel meta narrative, right? But people would have argued, hey, that doesn't quite work. Because after all, if you watch Captain America and then go ahead and watch Doctor Strange, and those are the only two you've seen, it'd be really hard to tell that they were connected stories. How can you call something a meta narrative that doesn't seem to connect? Well, even with all the different directors and writers involved and all the different finagling and deal cutting and, and arguing that goes on behind the scenes, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has managed to keep one big story going through many connecting plot points throughout their timeline and through each movie and show, even if it has required traveling and time at some points. 
they've actually done a much better job of this than some, uh, you know, other universes where squabbling writers and directors, or maybe even the intervention of studios, has totally ruined the plotline. Yes, I'm talking about Star Wars there. I know some of you are mad, but that's okay. So what's my point? Well, how does this connect? Just because the Bible is big and complicated and presents some questions that seem unanswered, doesn't mean that all of those different parts aren't all part of the same universe. After all, if someone as big and powerful and all-knowing as God chose to record his story through a creation as tiny and faulty and flawed as humanity, then it's no wonder that humanity can't always see how those plot points line up. What we really need is a storyboard, right? We need some big diagram or defining grid through which we can understand this huge story and see it from a better angle. And that's what we hope we've provided with the five act outline that we've presented every week in this series. It's from the book, The Drama of Scripture. And it goes like this, hopefully you know it by now, creation, fall, covenant, redemption, restoration. If you know it, you should say it along. Creation, fall, covenant, redemption, restoration. Here's the thing though, as mentioned, in the same way that watching one or two seemingly disconnected movies isn't going to help you understand that whole universe, reading one or two disconnected parts of the Bible isn't really going to help you understand the meta narrative much clearer. And knowing it is so much more important than comic book trivia because the Bible claims to be the narrative, the story of the creator of the universe, of everything that has ever been and ever will be. That's a pretty important claim. And without studying it as a whole and continuing to dig deeper into it yourself, you're just going to be confused and discouraged and you might even draw some really problematic claims from it. But we don't just read it to figure out what God has done. We also read it to figure out what God is doing now. And unlike passive participants in a movie theater, we're asked to get up out of our seats because as believers, we are also a part of this big story, not just as cosplayers, but as actual characters. And we better figure out how it's supposed to be played out, right? If that's true, if we're part of this, then we better figure out what our roles are. This week, we are moving into the part of the story called covenant. This is one of the largest acts in the narrative stretching through most of the Old Testament. And as we move through this act, we might wonder what exactly is a covenant and why is it called covenant rather than covenants? Well, there's a covenant, which is a promise. And there are many covenants or promises made through this section of scripture. The main ones being to Abraham, and then the nation of Israel, and then to David. Or put another way, first to a family, the line of Abraham, and second to a tribe, the large tribe of Israel with 12 families, and then to a nation under a king named David. Covenant, we know, is another way to describe a formal agreement. And in these agreements, God requires certain commitments of humanity and in return makes several promises. Commitments from humanity, promises from God. The irony being that while these keep happening, we'll see humanity fail over and over and over again to keep up their side of the bargain, while God will continue to faithfully uh, act and to faithfully keep his side of the promises. In fact, he holds up, he upholds that promise so perfectly 
that we come to understand there is really only one covenant that is just being expanded generation after generation. God's promise to fulfill his rescue plan. But let's rewind to the beginning, okay? Where it all starts with a guy named Abram. Abram, or Abram as we more often call him, shows up quite suddenly in Genesis chapter 12. Or we might say God shows up quite suddenly to him. Genesis 12, 1 through 4 says, The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. We don't really know how much contact Abram had with God before this moment, but as we've seen in the story so far, we had the perfect creation made by God, broken by humanity's choice to follow their own way in the fall, and we've seen the consequential brokenness that affected all the earth. But all along, there has been this glimmer of hope, the hope that God's plan is not done, that he is going to partner with humanity, and that out of humanity, he will bring someone to set it all right. Yet all the way up to chapter 12 in Genesis, we don't see much to understand that God's actually doing that, right? Instead, we see a lot of sin, the consequences of it being in a worldwide flood. We see humanity's desire to disobey further and the scattering of the nations across the earth. That's a lot in 11 chapters. And now a seemingly inconsequential encounter with a guy named Abram. Here God first asks Abram to leave his home behind and go to a land that he'll be shown. In return, God makes the promises to make him a great nation to give him land and to bless all peoples through him, to make him a great nation, giving him descendants, to give him a land and to bless all peoples through him. These promises are repeated over and over again and expanded on throughout Abram's life. In Genesis 15, we see God symbolize the gravity of this agreement with an animal sacrifice, repeating his promise to give Abram descendants and a promised land. Then in Genesis 17, God again repeats his promises. Verses 1 and 2 say, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. He's even renamed Abraham, father of nations at this point, to reflect the promises of God. But of course, if you're familiar with the story of Abraham at all, you know that it's not easy sailing, right? There's family discord, there's infidelity, war, strife over land and resources. And Abraham is not the beacon of faithfulness and blamelessness that you would expect of somebody who's been chosen to partner with God. Not at all, really. And things don't seem to get much better with his son or grandson either. But just as the Lord made a promise to Abraham, he repeats this covenant with the son Isaac. Genesis 26, 2 through 4 says, The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father, Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. And then God repeats the promise, even to the wily trickster uh, grandson, Jacob, who's at this moment running away from home. 
In Genesis 28, 13 through 15, he says to Jacob, I am the Lord your God, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you." And these promises are such that what should have been a blip on the radar, a footnote in the books of history, an unassuming patriarch, a fearful and often failing son, a lying, thieving grandson, becomes the foundation for the establishment of a nation, a whole nation defined by one repeated promise, generation after generation, that can be summed up by this statement we see in Exodus 3, 6. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The covenant then isn't just a people, and it isn't just a land, and it isn't just pouring blessing out on all the nations, though that's probably the most important part we forget about. The covenant is God working with us. God working with the old and questioning Abraham. God working with the fearful and failing Isaac. God working with the deceitful Jacob. God working with humanity to save humanity. And it may be for you or for someone you know that you're put off a bit by this, by the God of the Old Testament. Because in working in and through faulty humanity, God gets involved in, I don't know, some shady situations, some very strange things. And in explaining this covenant to a specific people in specific circumstances. He uses means that would have been very familiar to them, but which just seem bizarre to us. After all, Abraham understood agreements made by cutting animals in two. And Abraham understood symbolizing promises on one's skin, like the strange rite of circumcision. Isaac understood tests of faith, like the one he went through on the mountaintop with his father, and blessings passed from generation to generation, from father to son. Jacob understood visions like the one of the ladder to heaven and how they gave glimpses into a reality just very, just slightly separated from our own. And Jacob understood tests of strength, like wrestling with a mysterious messenger for God's favor. So it isn't any wonder that we sometimes find the patriarchs bizarre, though I'd argue half the problem is not giving them enough context. But the bottom line isn't these things, these episodes, these rites. The bottom line is God's covenant. God keeping his part of the partnership. God working with faulty, broken people to fulfill the plan until his faithfulness shows up in a person. God incarnate, Jesus Christ, the one who perfectly fulfills every broken commitment humanity has ever made. So that at the proper time, generations after Abraham, Paul can write in Galatians 3, 26 through 29, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Did you hear that part? Heirs according to the promise. Inheritors of the covenant. 
you and I, believers in Christ, aren't taking a backseat to the Old Testament where we look at it and we think, oh, God used to speak personally to people. Or, on the other hand, ignoring the Old Testament altogether because some parts seem strange to us. No, we are actually a part of this story. So we have to know it. Anyone who puts on Christ through faith, receiving what he has done to fulfill the promises of God, is a descendant, an heir of Abraham himself. And all the broken promises, the untruths, the failures are made right because Jesus is the fulfillment of all God's promises. And if this is true, if we're part of this story, a part of this covenant family, then we don't stop with the Old Testament. And church, we don't stop with the New Testament either. As central as Paul's words are in Galatians, we shouldn't be stopping there and saying, yeah, you know, I'm part of the promise through Jesus, so I'm going to go about my day now. No, we should be asking now, now that we're saved in Christ, now that we're reconciled to the Father, now that we're adopted into the family, now that we're empowered by the Spirit, how do we, the people of God, how do we, Hill City in Thornton, Colorado, we players and participants in this story, go forth and bless all peoples of the earth? because that's what it's all pointing to. The covenant of God fulfilled in the kingdom work that Jesus preached and instructed his followers to carry out did not go on hold after the New Testament ended. We're not just sitting around waiting for his return. We, the church, have been tasked to keep doing it. And we do it by living our lives as his representatives, saturating earth with the life of heaven. N.T. Wright writes in Surprised by Hope, what you do in the present by painting, preaching, singing, sewing, praying, teaching, building hospitals, digging wells, campaigning for justice, writing poems, caring for the needy, loving your neighbor as yourself, will last into God's future. These activities are not simply ways of making the present life a little less beastly, you can tell he's English, a little more bearable, until the day when we'll leave it behind altogether, as the hymn so mistakenly puts it. Instead, they are part of what we may call building for God's kingdom. Those everyday acts, if they are carried out as heirs to the promise of God, are part of what we may call building for God's kingdom. So I wanna ask you as we end, are you a part of this story? Do you know if you are a part of this story? Have you answered God's call that he's put out to all of humanity to come be a part of it, to join him in this great project, to be reconciled to him and fully restored through Jesus Christ, for our sins to be forgiven, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit and to live your life in the church, in the body of Christ carrying out his work in the world. Are you a part of this story? And if you haven't become a part of the story, why not? What is holding you back? If you're curious about it, I want to encourage you, ask someone. Ask me, ask the person sitting next to you on the couch if they know it. Call someone up, text a friend, ask someone. Ask about becoming a part of this story. God is inviting you, not just to be a part of story, but come be a part of this covenant because I'm faithful. I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's shown it for thousands of years and he will show it until the end of time and beyond. He's faithful. He won't leave you or forsake you. And he's saying, come be a part of the story, be a part of my family. Let's pray. Dear God, I just pray if there's anyone listening right now who wants to be a part of your family, who's being stirred by the Holy Spirit to say, I want to be a part of this story. I don't know how. Pray that you would help them to have the courage to ask, 
to ask someone sitting next to them, to ask a friend, to ask someone here at Hill City, what do I need to do to be saved? As that famous line goes. Lord, we pray that you would stir in their hearts the desire to confess first their sins before you, to confess that they are a broken part of humanity, that they don't know how to do it, to lay all those things before you, to surrender their lives, to say, Jesus, you can have my life. You can have every part of it. And to say, I want to follow you. Lord, I pray that you would take those steps, that they would talk further about it, and that you would save people, Lord, and bring them into this story, not to just sit around until uh, heaven, heaven is uh, some place we go to, but until heaven is restored on earth and that they can be a part of that. Just pray, Lord, for your wisdom, for um, people to reach out to those they know who need to hear about this story. We pray for every person who's saved and is struggling to know how they fit in. Lord, that you would just put on their hearts something important you want them to do in their daily lives and in this church. Thank you, Lord, for every single person who calls Hill City home. We pray we would be filled with your spirit and go out and share your story with everyone we know. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.